Good evening. Good evening. I'd like to uh, spend my ten minutes telling you, giving you a brief summary about my life. <laughs> but just to set the scene, I got a new part-time job recently. Well, I call it a part-time job, but my supervisor calls it community payback. <laughs> anyway, I was chatting with me new pals from community payback, and I told them I started doing stand-up comedy, and they were really interested, asking me lots of questions, which was nice. And then one of them said to me. Are you any good? And I said, well, I've not been doing it long. It's a work in progress, but I reckon I'm about 50% of the way there. And he said, what do you mean by that? I said, well, I'm confident, but I'm not funny. <laughs> I think it's best to share that with you now so everyone's expectation is set at a realistic level. Now, I turned 50 last year, and while reaching this milestone doesn't particularly bother me, it did give me cause to reflect on my life, think about my past, my future, and even my own mortality. And the issue of my own mortality was brought sharply, sharply into focus last Saturday morning when I was shopping at Tesco's and my bag for life ripped. And now, I wonder how long I've got left. <laughs> I got to looking back over my life and um, thinking about my early years. And I don't really have very clear recollections of me infants and junior school days, but what I do remember is running home from school to watch children's TV. Now in those days, it was on from four till six and on two channels, and you got quite attached to it. And I think the best way to share my feelings with you about this is through a very short poem, and it's called Every Cloud. <laughs> I wrote to Blue Peter to ask them for a badge. I wrote a lovely letter, but they never did write back. I wrote to Cracker Jack for a Cracker Jack pencil and pen, but when there was no reply, I was disappointed once again. I wrote to Basil Brush, but he ignored me flat. So I wrote to my MP to bring fox hunting back. <laughs> I wrote to Noel Edmonds to swap an unwanted toy. I waited and I waited, but still I got no joy. I only had one chance left to get heard on TV, but now I'm feeling quite relieved. Jim didn't fix it for me. <laughs> recollections of my secondary school days. I went to an all-boys Catholic school run by Jesuit priests. That was a bag of laughs, I can tell you. In religious education, the teacher said to us, it's a sin to touch your genitals unless you're having a wash or going to the toilet. Imagine telling 14-year-old boys that. 14-year-old boys whose main preoccupation is masturbation. Now, this gave us a real dilemma, because we didn't want to go to hell, but the urge to masturbate was overwhelming. The priest said to us, when faced with temptation of the flesh, we had to pray to save our souls. It turned out we didn't have to. Some of the priests were prepared to risk their souls to help us out. <laughs> we, had, we had swimming lessons and the swimming teacher said to us, uh, to reduce the risk of drowning, never go swimming in a pool where you can't confidently swim one length. Now I'm a pretty strong swimmer, but I reckon that bit of advice probably saved my life because whenever I go on holiday, it doesn't matter how hot it is, I'll never go swimming in the infinity pool. <laughs> Unfortunately, bullying was a feature at my school, and one morning I got there, and there on the wall by the school gate, in big white paint letters, it said, John Fitzpatrick is a wanker. And I thought, that's a bit harsh. And such a narrow, a narrow appraisal of me, there's far more to me than that. <laughs> so I thought I'd take back the power. So the next morning I go up early and I went in with my own tin of white paint and I wrote on the wall next to it and he also likes making airfix models. <laughs> <laughs> Backfired, no one gave a shit about me being a wanker but I got the crap beaten out of me for being a model making nerd. Anyway, I was happy to leave school and I think in those years of your late teens and your early twenties are when you feel most optimistic about life. And when you listen to songs at that age, the more than just songs, the promises of what your future love life might hold. Now in my twenties, I went travelling to India, and a friend of mine had been to India, said, if you're going to India, better take some condoms with you, because they can be hard to find there. So maybe I was feeling optimistic that Saturday morning when I went into Superdrug in Chorley, <laughs> and I bought a 48 pack of condoms. Because <laughs> when I was finished travelling four years later, I counted them up, I'd used four as shower caps, <laughs> and the rest had accumulated more air miles than Alan Wicker. <laughs> so when I look back on those dating years, I think I was right about songs being promises of what your future love life might hold, and given that, I wish I'd spent less time listening to the Buzzcock song, Ever Fall In Love With Someone You Shouldn't Have Fallen In Love With, and more time listening to Come On Eileen. <laughs>
<laughs> I got back from travelling and in my thirties had a relationship and in that time lost touch with a lot of my friends and then when you get to 40 people start becoming single again and this happened to me and a group of my friends who lived in London so we had a reunion and while I was down there they made me aware of a concept in, in dating that was new to me and I'll be honest with you I felt like I was missing out because while all my friends in London had friends with benefits I was living in Chorley and all I had was friends on benefits <laughs> so I thought I'd rectify this with a bit of internet dating now, the problem with internet dating is there's so many profiles, you, you find yourself discarding people for the slightest reasons. But I thought, I'll give it a go. And I saw this one advert, look promising, it said, Sally, 36, ready for anything, anytime, anywhere. Now, unfortunately, Sally had spelled the where in anywhere, W-E-R-E, -E, and I thought, she's not ready for a spelling test. <laughs> anyway, I did meet someone, and I, I did meet her through the internet. I met her through the more traditional and, in my opinion, respectable method of um, stalking. <laughs> but, having gone through this process later in life of trying to meet someone, it, it came to me, to me how difficult it is to meet people with similar interests to yourself, and, and it got me thinking about um, child-killing couples. <laughs> Bear with me. <laughs> now, the thing that amazes me about child-killing couples is how the hell do they find each other? It took me 43 years to meet someone who thinks that Bob Dylan's all right. <laughs> Bob Dylan was playing Liverpool a few years ago and I said to my girlfriend at the time, I said, Bob Dylan's playing Liverpool, me and my brother are going, tickets are pretty expensive, you wanna go, I'll treat you. And she said, you know what, I'm not that bothered about seeing him, but knowing how much you'll enjoy it, I'll come along so I can just see you so happy. And I thought, is that how it works with child killing couples? <laughs> 65 quid for my girlfriend to see me happy. I tell you what would have made me happy, not spending 65 quid. <laughs> Unfortunately, it didn't work out. It turned out that she did like Bob Dylan. It was me that she wasn't that keen on. <laughs> but in, in that relationship, I did learn a lot of valuable things. And one thing I did learn about women is that they're weird. They don't like eating the same meal every night. Now this became an issue between, for me and my girlfriend and so I thought I'm going to do something about this and I'm going, to, I'm going to cook her a proper meal. So I rang up a female friend of mine and I said, listen, I need to cook my girlfriend a meal. She's getting pissed off with the frozen fish and veg every night. And I said, but I, I can't cook. And she said, right, don't worry about it. Get yourself a Jamie Oliver cookbook and follow the instructions to the letter and you'll be fine. I didn't give myself much time. I got the book on the Wednesday. I thought, it's all right, I can sit down and read it tonight. Choose, a, choose what I'm going to make, buy the stuff tomorrow night, and then make the meal Friday night. Sat down with the book, opened it up, first page, it said, get to know your butcher. I thought, fuck it, no, I haven't got time for this. Anyway, with the aid of Google and 192, I did manage to track him down. He wasn't best pleased, really, if I'm honest, to hear from me. He was confused, and it didn't end well. After about two minutes, he hung up, saying, if I ever hang him again, he'd call the police. <laughs> And in hindsight, maybe I shouldn't have asked him what school his kids went to, but what constitutes getting to know somebody? <laughs> anyway, I, I settled on a recipe and then I looked down and it said, use 200 grams of leftover brisket. I thought, fucking hell, now I have to make a meal the night before. <laughs> it didn't happen. We got a takeaway, that was just another nail in the confidence of that relationship. <laughs> Anyway, another thing uh, I think when you turn 50 that you, you have to adjust is your sexual fantasies. And um, <laughs> now I'm 50, uh, my adjusted sexual fantasy of three in a bed is me and two hot water bottles. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so here I am, find myself 50 years old, single, doing stand up comedy. And I've come to realise that stand up and sex have some similarities for me in that. It's two areas of my life where I'm very insecure. <laughs> it's not enough that I can hear that you're enjoying the performance. When I've finished, I need you to tell me how good I was. <laughs> now, I've been single for a couple of months now, and when I first became single, I saw an article in the paper and it gave me some hope, and it said, um, it was a survey of women, what they look for in a partner, and it said 97% of women think a good sense of humour is the most important quality in a partner. Two months down the line, you know what I'm going to tell you about that research? When research about what they look for in a man, only 3% of women tell the truth. 
Well, there, are, there is hope in this game, because during standoff, uh, about a month or so ago, I was doing a gig, and while I was on stage, I saw this woman looking at me, smiling, I thought, hello. And this <laughs> led to uh, a conversation after the gig, which left, led to uh, exchanging mobile phone numbers, which led to texting, which led to a date that didn't end as well as it could have done, which led to uh, stalking, <laughs> which led to an unpleasant court appearance, which led to community payback, and that's my life today. Thank you very much.